I'm Scott Hingstrom. I'm the director of the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife, and we've been involved in hosting this uh, uh, series of seminars, and this is our fifth uh, seminar of this uh, uh, 2018 uh, CNR colloquium. Um, so we have several up here listed, as you can see. Uh, I just wanted to mention of the sponsors of the colloquium that we have here, the College of Natural Resources, Kennedy Grody Endowment, Stevens Endowment, Rural Revitalization and Extension Act, University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, Wisconsin Center for Wildlife. So we're very pleased to, to have all the sponsorship. And I wanted to mention a, a shout out for Jennifer Summers, who's helped uh, coordinate all of these uh, uh, seminars, and helping with travel arrangements, et cetera. Um, I would like to mention that uh, we won't have a seminar next week because we're in the middle of spring break, but the week after, so March 28th, our own Dean, Christine Thomas, will be presenting the, uh, essentially the anchor of our seminar series. She'll be talking about, uh, as you can see, educating and inspiring the next generation of conservation leaders. So I hope all of you can join us for that last seminar of the, of the season. Um, we have a recent agreement that has been established with the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point and the indigenous peoples here, and we've been uh, asked and encouraged to present this at any time that we have a public gathering on campus. And so we recognize the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point occupies lands of the Ho Chunk and Menominee people. Please take a moment to acknowledge and honor the ancestral Ho Chunk and Menominee land and the sacred land of all the indigenous people. Thank you. With that, I'd like to, uh, it's actually my pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker, uh, A.J. DeRosa. I have a little bit of information for you regarding A.J. Come on in. Um, <laughs> A.J. is a founder and creative director of Northwoods Collective. It's an online set of information, uh, videos, magazines, books, links, etc., and social media associated with upland bird hunting, working dogs, and uh, a life outdoors, so an outdoor lifestyle. Um, he's the producer of the award-winning project Upland, which is a film series as well as a magazine which illustrates passion and culture of an outdoor lifestyle. Uh, he's an author of The Urban Deer Complex, which is a book on uh, behavior and management of deer in urban environments. Uh, AJ and his family, they hail from the big city of Boston, uh, but he likes to get outdoors as often as he possibly can into the wilds and uh, in the great outdoors. Uh, I met AJ in 2018 at the Wildlife Society's uh, annual conference in, uh, in uh, Cleveland. And uh, he presented to a working group that we had there. And I was just fascinated by the message that he portrayed to us. And so it's my pleasure, uh, AJ is here to talk today with us about a new culture of conservation, misunderstanding a generation. AJ. Thank you. When he said fascinated, he meant that I swore a lot. <laughs> so as a millennial, I don't really ever, literally ever use PowerPoint. So if I screw this up, sorry. Um, this photo was actually taken uh, right just outside of Park Falls. I was here a few years ago doing a film called Camp Thunderbird. Um, the girl on the left, Lane, actually works at a tattoo shop here in town. I forget the name of the shop. I don't know if anybody knows that. And then Brandon, phenomenal woodworker. Um, but anyways, figured I'd start that. So uh, who here was born between 1980 and 2000? All right. Who was born after 2000? No, 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 nobody that young. All right, so we have a lot of millennials. I am a millennial. I was born in 1982. So there's a lot of debate over when a millennial actually is and whatnot, but for the most part, it's agreed upon that anybody from 1980 to 2000. So in the world of hunting and fishing and trapping and all those things, conservation, a lot of people don't like to pay attention to millennials. So that's a lot of what I do is try to make people pay attention to millennials because we matter. Um, here's a few facts that people get wrong. First of all, we're the largest generation um, right now in the world. Um, will soon be debunked by Generation Z, which is still a very similar generation. Um, we have the date, we're, the, we're digital hybrids, we're not the first digital natives, that will be Generation Z. Um, we spend $200 billion a year, which as of this year is the most of any generation. So we spend more money than any other generation, so don't make anybody think that you don't like do anything for the world. Um, 
we like to spend for experiences, which is one of the most interesting things when talking about hunting and fishing. So part of that is that um, we're a little reckless with our money. We don't want materialistic things. We want to pay for experiences and we'll blow money for experiences. And it's Goldman Sachs that says that, so that's pretty credible. Um, we have more money and we're the largest workforce. Um, and we'll get more into that. So 93% of us read reviews. Uh, we like peer influence because we care about what our friends said or other people and we trust those opinions rather than professionals or some brand telling you this is what's right, this is what's wrong, which is very different than previous generations. We also don't fall for false information as often, which is pretty interesting. We're also big into self-directed learning, meaning that we all, I have a bachelor's degree in YouTube. So um, that's how I made this. <laughs> So 80% of us read, um, which is more than what baby boomers read. Um, on top of that, uh, we prefer to read our news over watching television to get our news. Uh, we prefer print over digital content if it's the same price. Um, and on top of that, we're actually saving mom and pop bookstores. So a lot of people don't get that, but Barnes and Nobles put an end to them and now there's all of a sudden this revival of mom and pop bookstores and it's because of millennials. So we do good things. All right. Hunting culture is dying for the third time. So I'm going to start this with a little story because this is the stuff Scott wanted me to talk about. This is the controversial stuff that I say that's very unpopular in older crowds and government agencies. Um, so if we look back into what hunting was in the United States and we go back to the market hunting days, people would go out and there was no regulation. You could kill what you want, you could sell it, you could do all these things. And we decimated the populations of the United States. White-tailed deer almost went extinct. Ducks were getting shot with cannons, like stuff was just crazy. So after that, on the hot on its heels, came the world of Teddy Roosevelt, as most of us know it. All these laws get passed, the Lacey Act, Pittman-Robinson, all these good things start to happen so that we can protect our natural resources. Um, and it gives birth to this generation that is really passionate conservationists. They care about all these things. They care about how many deer there are, how many grouse there are, whatever it might be, and everything's happy and fun. Well, out of that thing comes the invention of stuff like Boone and Crockett, which started as a record book. That idea of that record book was to celebrate conservation milestones. So when they measured deer or they measured elk or anything else, it was to say, well, we went from the verge of extinction all the way back up to these things, and that's something to celebrate. Well, that culture died, and this is where I start getting unpopular amongst certain crowds. What happened to that culture was we started celebrating the name next to the number instead of the number itself. So we got into the culture that we live in today, um, which is ultimately this world of the outward projection. If you're not a hunter, which I'm sure there's some people in here, what you see is what people are putting out on the internet. It's people behind big bucks. It's people, you know, I killed all these birds. I did all this stuff, which it's really tough to see through that for surface level perception to understand that that's not what people are doing. Like, yes, they are eating meat. That's by default, it would be tough to find people that didn't actually eat the meat. But the thing is, is that we've made this loud industry that just shows this trophy, trophy obsessed thing. And it just, it's created this toxic environment. It's created a situation where um, I was at an event recently um, with the Quality Deer Management Association and people would tell a story about they shot this deer and then they'd apologize because of the size of it because uh, it wasn't you know, that big. And, and I thought to myself, where, where did we lose track that you would sit there and apologize about taking something's life. Where's the respect in that animal? Where did we lose that? So that's part of what this gets down to, is hunting culture's dialing for the third time. So it died once, market culture was gone, brought the Teddy Roosevelt world. Teddy Roosevelt world died and it gave uh, you know, this whole new wave of trophy hunting culture. And that pisses people off when I say that. All right, so what's the problem here? Well, we need more hunters. Why do we need more hunters? Well, Pittman Robinson um, ultimately helps us raise money for conservation. It's how state agencies, federal government, they got all sorts of money on the taxation of hunting and fishing. Um, and ultimately, it creates this income source so that we can protect these resources. Um, so that's the huge problem. And as a industry. And when I say that, I'm, I, I look at it from two points. You have the commercial end, which are brands that are for profit along with media groups. And then you have the other side, which is federal and state agencies um, and nonprofits. Um, we lived in a world where everybody said, well, hey, you know, this is great. We're, we're doing this for conservation. Um, and it hasn't worked. Um, hunting's on the decline. It's, I don't know what the actual numbers is, but it peaked in, I believe, 1980 or 1982. And now we've been on this like dramatic steady decline and everybody's in panic mode. Oh my God, like we're going to lose all this money. 
And I'll say even more unpopular things about that when we get further into this. All right. Um, oh, wait a minute. So part of what I'm getting at is uh, the issue about hunting and why we've lost the decline of hunters here isn't a question of conservation. It's not a question of changing culture. It's a question of marketing and PR. Again, we created this really poor outward perception. As millennials, we don't really find that whole trophy culture thing really cool. Um, and I always like to point out something because uh, I tend to get a lot of hate mail from baby boomers. And um, once in a while, I get the whole, uh, oh, well, this is coming from the generation that got participation trophies. And it's like, listen, dude, that was your generation that created it for us. <laughs> All right. So we're going to do something fun here. Um, do you agree or disagree with the following statement? I think hunting is an activity in which an individual piquette competes against another or others for entertainment. Raise your hand if you think that that's what hunting is. That's, that's good. All right. 87% of people disagree with the statement. We did a study uh, last year specifically around this. That is actually the definition of the word sport. As a culture, we project hunting to the rest of the world. People do not know anything about hunting, didn't grow up in the culture, as sport. I don't think there's anything particularly sporting about something dying. And I know that, again, is a very unpopular comment. But the reality is you're taking something's life. That comes with certain levels of moral responsibility, using the resource that you actually went out and killed, doing things like protecting that resource to make sure it's there tomorrow. Um, and those, those are very important things that are missed in this word sport. So part of what I'm trying to build up here is the outward projection that hunting has given to the rest of the world that was created under this trophy culture has not been a good one. Because now when people try to defend things or they say things and you hear the word sport and it's sporting and it's like, you just can't say the word sport and stuff dies. You know, it's not Rome and we're not like killing people, gladiators and stuff. You know, if we were doing that, that would actually probably even be like just way more politically correct because, you know, the, you're killing an animal and there's not a, and even anything there. Um, but there is if we're protecting them. All right, so conservation is the wrong message. This is the one that Scott really wants to hear. <laughs> so this is my big thing is um, what we're going to get into here is that the idea of saying conservation is hunting and hunting is conservation is really easy to screw up real fast. Um, it's just, it's poisonous. And it's, it's just like, it's one of those things where like, if you just say something, you're never going to be able to finish the sentence and people have preconceived notions and lots of bad things happen and just, it's, it's, it's a disaster. So what I like to say is don't put the car before the horse. And part of that has to do with ultimately, if you get more hunters, um, by default, you're going to create conservationists. And that's more important specifically with millennials. And I'll get into that later on here. So hunting is conservation. How does that make you feel? Anybody particularly excited about that statement? Hunting is conservation? No? No emotions? No? All right. That photo right there is another tattoo artist. They tend to film a lot of tattoo artists. <laughs> it's, it's purely, it's literally accidental, though, I swear. <laughs> Lane's the only one that I've filmed that's actually tattooed me. So, all right, hunting is killing. Does that piss anybody off in here? Any, any hunters in here? You don't particularly feel that that's a great statement, right? That's not making you feel warm and fuzzy in the right ways. That's part of what I'm getting to about the whole idea of using the word conservation. Um, it's a loaded comment. It's a loaded comment in both directions because hunting is killing is emotional. And without getting too far down a rabbit hole, you know, what my company does, what we do um, is work in marketing. And marketing in 2019 is driven on emotions. So if I wanted to be on the winning end of this battle that we're doing right here in the current method that everybody's using to portray this to the rest of the world, I would choose to be on the anti-hunting side because that statement brings passion to me. So Nancy Reagan, yes. You just can't have a presentation without Nancy Reagan in it. So this gets back into some marketing theories. And I, I don't think anybody here goes to school for marketing, but I'm a marketing nerd. And this is, again, getting harder to this point. So she had this famous Just Say No campaign. Um, some people might remember it, some people might not. Um, and it was super good intentions. Um, the whole idea was say no to drugs. So that's like a great thing, like don't do that. Um, 
But sometimes we do things with good intentions, bad things happen, and again, because you've created a loaded situation. So the whole idea was they created all these commercials to show, well, you know, kids are actually doing drugs, and when they ask you to do drugs, don't do drugs. Well, what happened? Everybody kind of said, well, if everybody else is doing drugs, am I kind of the loser now? So like the whole campaign blew up, and it actually, they proved uh, through a number of metrics that it actually increased drug use in kids. Um, but she meant well, so it's not, it's, this is literally not a slight against Nancy Reagan, for the record, this is a slight against the campaign. And it's a great example of how things can get messed up in the world of telling stories and trying to portray things and good messages and how they can fall apart real quick. All right, so what is, conserva what is the conservation solution? Get more millennials involved. So before I get into that, I kind of want to get into the word conservation. So the word's been used in two ways. And this was getting back to that perception thing. If I say to you, well, I'm a, a hunter because I'm a conservationist. You're an anti-hunter. You're saying you're giving yourself an excuse for killing shit. It's just the way it goes every time. We've all been there. And now on the other end, what you have is this trophy culture, this trophy crazed culture that um, at some points um, truly don't adhere to this definition. And, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. But um, the, the word conservation gets weaponized. So instead of us having a casual conversation when you're an anti-hunter and I'm a uh, pro-hunter or whatever else, now I throw it in your face. I say, well, I'm a conservationist. I do more than you. Now that just turned toxic. There's no way, like if you go to therapy, you do like marriage counseling, there's just like, there's nothing healthy coming out of it. There's not a mutual good conversation. There's no way that that conversation can go good. That's part of why conservation is a bad message in hunting. And the one unique piece of this puzzle is millennials. And part of what I'm going to get to further in here is why, as a culture, millennials are fundamentally different, so you don't have to really force people to be conservationists. So conservationists, a person who advocates or acts for the protection and preservation of the environment and wildlife. So I have an honest question. I come up to Wisconsin. I hunted Wisconsin once. And uh, I bought a hunting license, OK? Now, you're from Wisconsin, and you've worked on all sorts of things, whatever else. You, you just live here. And now I say to you, well, I'm a conservationist. Well, you could easily say back to me, if you're getting clever and getting in an argument, well, you're required by law to do that, which is the truth. I'm required by law to buy a hunting license to hunt in the state of Wisconsin. It's a requirement, period. The whole idea of a person who advocates or acts for the protection and preservation, I'm required by law. I'm not taking an extra step. I'm not going the extra mile to say I'm taking from this resource and I'm going to go the extra step. I'm going to be a member of a nonprofit. I'm going to volunteer my time. I'm going to get educated on the subject. I'm going to practice uh, responsible hunting practices or whatnot. The ethics that people don't see when people aren't there. None of that comes out in this. And this is, again, part of why this word can be toxic. All right. So what if hunters looked like this sample? So. You're all a bunch of millennials, so you can probably relate to some of this. Maybe some of you disagree with it. But 87% of millennials believe climate change is real. Um, if you ever want to get yourself potentially dragged and beaten in a national conference on hunting, say that. I've done it. Um, also say, uh, well, I'll get to that one in a minute. So that's a, a national statistic. We're actually dot. Um, diving deeper into that actually in a study we're doing right now and we're actually going to find out inside of a hunting audience um, that's a millennial platform how many millennials that are proactive hunters actually believe that climate change is real. Um, on top of that, 75% of, uh, mem of millennials are members of nonprofits. This is specifically taking from the Project Upland audience and I'm going to get back into this. So this is something that's unique. Uh, we do a lot of work with the Rough Grouse Society. We work on their communications plan, so we do a lot of data mining with them and everything else. Um, when you look at baby boober generations, that number gets a lot lower a lot faster. It's not the attitude of um, what can I do for you, it's what can you do for me. If I, if I read you some of the emails I've seen from the Rough Grouse Society or studies we've done and the questions, it's like, and I'm not trying to dig at any baby boomers here, so I apologize. Like, there's, I'm not saying everybody's bad or... Anyway, so there's this really weird shift where as millennials, we find this fundamental thing that we care about the environment. We don't want to die. We don't want climate change to eat us in 20 years. At least I don't. Um, so 86% of us, um, hold on. Man, I can't even remember what I wrote here. What is this? Do you not believe? Oh, OK. This is also a statistic from, <laughs> 
that's me. Um, this is also a statistic from Project Upland. So 86% of people that follow Project Upland, millennials, um, do not believe that cable television shows accurately portray hunting. Now we're getting back into that whole thing, that trophy culture versus reality. What's actually happening? What are people doing? You get this whole culture creating this, this outward projection of just these bad, evil things. Lead is bad. I got crucified at SHOT Show for saying that. Actually, I wrote an article about it. And uh, I got pulled in a meeting with the National Shooting Sports Foundation. And they told me, and it was a funny conversation, I have a business partner and he tends to be a little more conservative than me and a little more uh, peacekeeping than I am. And we sat at this table, this round table discussion. We were supposed to have this meeting about business and it started out and their director of marketing says to me, hey, uh, we had talked to you about this thing. It's, you know, it's came up and we got to address it. He goes, um, you know, you can't use the word non-toxic when you talk about uh, lead. And because uh, we, we use the word non-toxic. He says, you're supposed to use the word alternative shot. And I go, why? And he goes, well, if you say non-toxic, you're, you're implying that lead is poisonous. And like, so it got quiet for a second. And I looked across the table and I go, but it is. <laughs> so I was told that we weren't allowed to put that stuff in our content, and I politely refused to ever do that. So we will not be corrupted. Sustainability. Um, this is one of the unique things that I always like to tell people, um, especially older generations that work in the industry or work in government agencies. Um, it's a really cool point to kind of uniquely look at the different mindset between a millennial and a baby boomer. When I go out and hunt, I simply say, is what I'm doing sustainable? Um, that is very rarely the first thought of a baby boomer. Um, this culture, this trophy culture, they're not asking that question. The idea of sustainability is how do I get the biggest deer in my property? They're not thinking about the fact that where I come from in Boston, deer are overgrazing. They're eating uh, you know, native species. Non-native plants are overtaking that ground. It's destroying all sorts of nesting habitat. It's a disaster. And what do people want? They want you to only shoot you know, big bucks. And they want to, you know, don't, I don't want to take time to shoot does. They don't want to actually manage, which is one of these unique, unique disconnects in the culture. So meat, this last one. A lot of millennials take up hunting because of meat. And there was an interesting study done recently um, by a very large study uh, agency in the industry who also don't like me. And their study came back and they had surveyed 2,000 millennials that watched the Outdoor Channel. Anybody in here watch the Outdoor Channel? Okay, so a handful of people, right? And you didn't even really feel cool about that, did you? You were kind of like, well, I do, but you know, I'm not gonna, <laughs> not gonna tell you that. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to razz on anybody. The point is, uh, what I'm trying to get to is they surveyed this audience and they also, also surveyed a group of baby boomers in the same crowd and they came back with a statement that, well, baby boomers and millennials hunt for meat. It, hunting for meat is about an equal reason. The problem with that is that it misses the culture. And the culture is, is that plenty of us actually take up hunting. We make this conscious decision because we grew up in the organic movement and all these other things to say, I don't want to buy meat anymore. And I'm going to go out and hunt it. And if I don't hunt it, I'm not going to eat it. That is not something you find with baby boomers. Are there baby boomers that go out and as a result of hunting, eat lots of meat and probably don't put meat on their table? I mean, don't put store-bought meat? Sure, it happens. And again, I'm not trying to razz at baby boomers. I feel like, you know, you just keep shaking. And I'm, not, I'm like, is he agreeing with me? Is he pissed at me? Is he going to trip me one time I pass through here? You know? <laughs> so... <laughs> Anyway, so my, the point being is what I'm trying to get to is as millennials, we look at this whole process differently. We're looking at it as a resource, something we have to protect, which is a theme of our generation period. I mean, we're growing up in the climate change crisis. And I said I wasn't going to get political, and I hope that's not political, but anyways. All right. Why is the hunting culture failing millennials? I've actually pretty much told you all of it. I mean... It's all of these things that we just don't relate to. And further, what happens is that the reality is, is that most of the industry is controlled by baby boomers. So if you're going to go and work for state agency, you're going to go work for a federal agency, you're going to find out real quick that there's a lot of baby boomers in there. Some of them are more welcome than others. There's some unbelievable people that are much older, that are in a position of powers, that are really clinging on to this and really paying attention. And you're going to find people that aren't. You're going to find a lot of people that aren't, and they're going to get in your way, and they're going to do crazy things, and it's frustrating, trust me. Um, it's failing us in a lot of ways. Um, we're not obsessed with racks. Is it, if, if I shoot a big buck, that's great. 
I, I would be excited about that. But it's not the methodology. It's not why we're there. Um, what they're putting out for content, what they're trying to sell us, what they're trying to put in our face is nothing that we believe in, nothing that we agree in. They censor you. Organizations want to tell you that you can't say non-toxic, um, you know, because you can't even put it in gasoline anyways. So, but that's the type of stuff that's happening. So as a result, our culture has failed us. And ultimately, a lot of us look at it, and, and what you saw is this big decline in hunting. What was it? Well, people that grew up in hunting families, they stopped actually being able to pass it on because they had no connection with their kids. There wasn't a connection there to say, okay, like I understand that this is different. It was kind of like this, this whole shift and everything. And one thing that millennials are apparently people find super annoying is we want to know why. And I see this a lot in dog training. So it's like people will tell me like, all right, so like, you know, you want your dog to be steady. And essentially what that means is dog points the bird, bird gets up in the air, bird gets shot. You don't release, until you release that dog, that dog doesn't move. So it's like, why? You know, I want to know why, you know? But normally people don't ask that question. That question frustrates people. Why frustrates people? I don't want to live in a world, and I'm sure you don't, where everything is told to me, this is just the way it's done. I want to know why it's done that way. And we're a very curious generation, and people don't appreciate that inside of our culture. And it makes it very unpopular very quick. But this is the reality. I got into it earlier about, you know, having a bachelor's degree in YouTube. and. Um, that's one of those things that frustrates people is this whole idea that you do want to dig deeper and you do want to see, well, well why do you do that? Why do you? And, and that, that comes from that whole culture. We're, we're huge on self-learning. We don't want a professional to show us. We don't like, we want to get the questions ourselves. And then no presentations complete without Popeye. <laughs> so anyways, anybody actually watch Popeye? Am I? Yeah. All right. So um, the spinach industry created Popeye with a one-third boost in U.S spinach consumption. This is a real thing. Um, so ultimately what we're getting down to is that, um, you know, spinach didn't make Popeye cool. I mean, it made him strong, but that was all part of his sales pitch. Um, ultimately, the whole idea is that Popeye made spinach cool. And this is like one of these fundamental flaws in this whole idea of how do we get more hunters? How do we get more trappers? How do we get people to involve in the resource? I mean, it's, it's kind of a simple thing. It's just, it's got to be cool. And I guess that's dumbing it down a bit. But it's like as simple as that. And what's not cool is what the current culture is because I just, we don't want that. For the most part, some of us might. Um, so that, that's where this whole conservation issue is an outward projection. And what I always say, and this is like the big bombshell, so I'm sorry. Um, I always say if the message conservation, hunting is conservation worked, I wouldn't be standing in this room because we wouldn't have a decline in hunters and people wouldn't care what I had to say and nobody would give a shit, oh, excuse me, <laughs> if, if millennials wanted to do it differently. <laughs> so, I almost made it. <laughs> I almost made it. Um, okay, anyways, this is part of it. Not all media is created equal, um, especially when it comes to the hunting industry. So I don't think I have to ask what picture is cooler there. Um, but this just really sums up, in a visual sense, the difference. Um, that is just a flat out whack em and stack em photo on the side. As a millennial, my first question is, is why are you spending so much money on a non-native species? Um, on both sides. <laughs> but at least on the left side, I'm like, man, that's a beautiful dog. <laughs> so. Anyway, so um, this really gets down to, again, this disconnect. Um, what a lot of agencies have tried to do, and, and this, is, this is something that I should point out here, is the blame doesn't lay on nonprofits. It doesn't lay on states. It doesn't lie on the government. Nobody here failed. Nobody, it was never the state's job to make hunting cool. It was never the state's job to sell you on hunting. It was never the state's job to do any of those things. The state had one job, and that's they sell the theme ticket to the park. That's it. And they're supposed to protect the resource. That's their job. And that's what it is. So there's a lot of science-based decisions based on it. Marketing, science just gets muddled real quick, real fast. Because it's, it's a lot of intuition. It's a lot of guts. It's a lot of emotion. So what happened was, again, in this culture, is you had commercial brands that pillage this culture on sh or in short-term games. And kind of what happened, I always use the example of the archery industry because um, they've always been so mean to me. And no, it's really not, not all of them. But anyways, um, you invent the compound bow. So I go out to you and I say, buy the compound bow. Now I say, 
Oh, that compound bow, you've had it for a year. I just invented the compound bow 1000. Gotta buy this, because this is the only reason you can kill a deer now. Then the next year goes by and I say, ho oh, ho, you think you can kill a deer this year? You can't, not if you don't have the, the compound bow 2000. So what we created was this, this idea in marketing that was based on short-term profits. It became this idea of aspirational hunting, macho images, mine's bigger than yours, mine's faster than yours, like just all this crazy stuff that just created this nasty, nasty culture. And it was created by media that was bought, you know, like it's like you open up, you know, Field and Streams magazine and it's one long advertorial. And if you open up Project Upland, okay, magazine, Project Upland magazine, this isn't a sales pitch, but what you will find is you can't get an advertorial in there. Um, because you're just not gonna let you corrupt our media. It's that simple. The whole idea is that we don't want you to tell us the lies that I could only do something because the compound bow 2000. This is how we really just got out of, out of whack in the world. And ultimately what happened is now states and nonprofits find themselves like, what are we gonna do? Now they have to make videos. Now states who are full of biologists and people of science, sound science, are saying, well, you know, how do I get more people hunting? And like, I'm not trying to take a rub at anybody, but it's like, don't send biologists to make films. <laughs> Just don't do it. <laughs> so, so it's an unfortunate situation where now this burden has fallen on uh, government agencies and nonprofits, Pheasants Forever, or National Wild Turkey Federation, um, stuff like that, um, that have to ultimately try to hold up a whole division of things that they don't do. Uh, and it's kind of unfair. So I had to do this because this is, this is my dog. So that's his name's Grim. So his, uh, his uh, nickname is Taco because he really loves tacos. It's all accidental. But anyway, so I had to get him up here at least once. Anyways, the rise of a new hunting culture. So kind of what I'm getting to here is that there's good news at, at the end of this. Um, and only millennials will probably agree. But what we're seeing here is the death of a third culture. The trophy culture is dying and it's dying quickly. The outdoor channel struggling. Um, most magazines are about to go out of business. Just about every single Upland magazine in the country is up for sale right now because they can't figure it out. Um, and that's the death of that different world. Um, but what you do have is millennials. And millennials are actually very passionate hunters when they get into it and they're in it for all these different reasons. They are a generation of conservationists. They are people that actually go out there and ask the questions like, should I be picking up my shells after I shoot my shotgun? Yes, you should. <laughs> um, we have this huge, like, weird thing inside the Project Upland culture where people have proactively given up lead shot with like, no, nobody telling them they had to do that, but like, millennials are just like, I'm not going to do that. And why? Like, first reason isn't even necessarily environment. It's like, I, all I eat is wild game. I don't want to be pulling lead out of this stuff if I'm eating it all the time. Like, I'm going to poison myself. I'm going to poison my kids. So it's a big shift. So now this debunks everything because this is, this is the truth. Project Upland is a successful millennial platform. Um, not the only one, but in the Upland space, it's now the biggest one. So these are true statistics, and it debunks everything that everybody said wasn't possible, all the naysayers and everything else. First of all, they said millennials didn't have money. Our median income for a Project Upland audience is $129,000 a year. If you actually look at the media kits of so the Outdoor Channel, Sportsman Network, Field and Streams, and everything else, that number is significantly higher than all of them. So it doesn't look like we don't have money anymore, does it? 55% of us come from urban and suburban environments. That's hot, way over the industry standard which is a very unique thing. Again, you have people coming out of cities that saying, this is my story. I grew up just outside of Boston, hunted a lot of suburban deer. It's what I had. And eventually I got burnt out. And I said, you know what? I want big wilderness. And how do I get big wilderness? I become a grouse hunter because you can't just casually hunt deer up in the North Country in New England, trust me. So I became a grouse hunter. That's what I did. 79% of us prefer internet and uh, only 17% of millennials say that they prefer cable. I'm pretty sure we all only watch Netflix at this point. Um, which is cool. Saw a new movie on there when I was on the plane. 47% uh, use a handheld device. So a big shift in the way we consume content. 31% of us still like a computer. I do like a computer. And 23% prefer TV. And when I say TV here, it's probably because you're streaming Netflix. 21% um, of our audience is female. Um, that's way over the industry average. Um, there's no secret that women are the fastest growing demographic inside the hunting space. And that is actually mostly due to a lot of good nonprofits and state agencies efforts to actually make women feel welcome. And 
I don't think there should be a world where a woman should have to walk into a hunter safety course and um, have 35 guys tell them that they're going to take them hunting. It's not what they're talking about. 75% of uh, the people that follow Project Upland are members of a nonprofit, millennials. Um, and I, I brought that stat earlier. And, and I want to focus on that because kind of what that is showing you is this ultimate focus of the idea that consciously, as a generation, we realize we have to do more than just buy a hunting license. We have um, a moral commitment to it. We have a mental commitment to it. And we don't want our planet to be dead. I don't want to live in a world where there's no longer rough grouse. I don't want to live in a world where there's no longer warblers or whatever else that I happen upon in my adventurous days. And 30% of the Project Upland audience, and this is actually the bombshell that allowed me to speak in places like this, 30% are first generation hunters, meaning that neither their mother or father hunted. That is the highest measured audience of first generation hunters in the entire industry for hunting. So we didn't realize that people were suddenly being inspired by Project Upland films to become hunters. We were just like, if you heard the real story of Project Upland, it wasn't some kind of master plan. It was AJ decided he was going to go run off up into the North Country on a couple days off when he had him here and there. And he got a camera and he was like, oh, cool, I'm just going to film this casually. Made this film. Everything spiraled out of control. Now Project Upland exists. So that's literally how it came to be. Um, that's that's a, just a weird world. And it happened because we appealed to millennials. Our stories were authentic. They weren't uh, over-exaggerated. They weren't unreal. They weren't about celebrities. They weren't about super hunters. They were just about normal people. People like me, I'm actually a normal person, uh, go out and I take my dog out and I hunt grouse in central New Hampshire and I'm lucky to see three in a day. And I still do that painfully. And I think that's actually my last slide. It is. So I'm going to take questions, but with my dog on there. <laughs> All right. Anybody have any questions? I can get down some rabbit holes here, so fire away. No, come on. Oh, there's got to be like at least one baby boomer that wants to like throw a zinger at me or something. Oh. Yes, <laughs> thank you. And I'm not going to take offense to it, so just lay it on. Thank you, girl. I'm the director of the Becoming the Outdoors Women program. My birthday is 1965, so that's amazing. Um, you mentioned that when millennials make the choice to hunt, it's oftentimes primary motivation is to get meat. Yes. And then you followed that up with, we won't find that among the baby boomers. Yes. I would argue that you will find that very much so among women mm -hmm. um, of all ages. Right. So maybe you can just. That's, that's a great point. Right. Well, around. and I think there's a relative nature to even to what you're saying past that is that the subject of organic meat and sustainable movements is relevant today, no matter what age you are. It's something that has happened. So. I would think that new hunters, no matter what their age are, are embracing that aspect of it. I've seen it over almost 25 years now, um, taking from age 40 to 65 right. is really that main audience that I work with. And um, brand new to hunting, when you ask them why they want to do it, it's because they want a connection to nature and they like to do it. That's awesome. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be the first one to say that women are way more responsible. So, <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, AJ, uh, thank you so much. You uh, share a lot about uh, perceptions among uh, baby boomers and uh, millennials. Do you find uh, in talking with Gen Xers at all that, that they're pretty much in between those two or they lean one way or another? Um, we, we, you know, I, I know this speech comes off as a bit like a baby boomer hate speech. Um, <laughs> not all baby boomers are like that. Um, Gen X is, is, you know, it's sometimes I feel like they're the ones that really embrace the trophy culture. Uh, they were the ones that really took the whack em and stack em mentality really to heart. It's a very competitive uh, generation. So yes, there's a lot of it in there. Um, but there again are still people, uh, we were talking earlier, there's a new president of the Rough Grouse Society and he's uh, 43 years old, so he would be Generation X. Um, he has a doctorate in forestry management and he is like the most passionate person I've ever met about forest health. Um, and he is just like, he'll be the first one to tell you like, and this is talking about a shift of culture. Um, some of you, if you are into grouse or anything, would have heard that Indiana is about to list them as, um, as an endangered bird in the state of Indiana. Um, if we rewind to three years ago and that happened, Rough Grouse Society never would have supported that decision. And Ben Jones, in the meeting that we had, was flat out like, we're supporting this listing. 
And that's a big shift in mentality in general. Uh, that to me, I mean, he's very much on the cusp, but that's Generation X and doing something good. So, any other questions? What was your uh, like, big come to hunting moment? Were you from a hunting family? Did you, like, what moment were you like, yeah, I, sh I need to like, yeah. do this and kind of push back against the, the, uh, the standard right now? Yeah, and it's probably, you're going to laugh. It's probably, this is probably like we should have a therapist in the room. So, um, my father uh, was a hunter and my grandfather was a hunter. And um, they would see a deer walk by a tree and they'd sit under that tree for five years waiting for it to come back. Um, <laughs> so they weren't very good at it. My parents are divorced. I didn't particularly care for my father. I was the younger of two brothers and um, I hated hunting when I was a kid. And I just like, I didn't like my father. So it just never went well. Um, I don't mind my father now. So my mother told me one of the greatest pieces of advice is don't love your father for who you want him to be, but for who he is. So <laughs> anyways, um, I hunt with my father now, but I detest hunting with my father nevertheless because my father does not eat wild game. And I think it's absolutely grotesque. Um, I eat everything he kills, so it's not like it is going to waste, but um, that's the family I grew up in. When I got back into hunting, I was in, I just graduated high school. Um, I was the first person in my family to take a bow hunting, and I just really went off the deep end, loved it, and I loved it for meat. I loved it for all the things that it was that it should have been loved for. And I became very passionate about it. I caught the bug for grouse, and then I got really conscious of conservation because when I was a deer hunter, I was sucked into that, oh, mine's bigger than yours, and we need more big deer and all these things. And then once I spent a lot of time around grouse and the Rough Grouse Society, I started to realize that like in eastern Massachusetts, that our habitat was decimated, you know, that these forests were overgrazed and it was a disaster. And that's when I started getting more and more passionate about it. And once Project Upland actually started to pan out and stuff actually started working as far as what we do, um, we just really tried to embrace that aspect. And uh, we're very adamant, like in our outward projection to say, if you're into hunting, if this is something you're going to do, um, if you don't have the financial resources to be a member of a nonprofit or to donate or to give back, then volunteer. Take somebody else hunting, at least. Do something. Um, so that's kind of how it all got there. I guess that was a, kind of a rabbit hole. <laughs> so a lot of the millennials in this room yep. are about to enter into the field. Primary a majority of them are probably going to be in the agency where they're working uh, with the public. And the majority of the public investment is the baby boomer generation right. or wherever they're going to go. So how would you advocate to work through the disconnect that you're saying there is? So mm -hmm. how, how can we meet in the middle and work with new professionals that are of this generation right. with the public that's of the older generation? Um, two things. Tell them to hire Northwoods Collect. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> No, there's actually a lot of states that are doing phenomenal things. Um, I want, it's the state of Oregon is actually crushing hunter recruitment right now. They're really cutting edge in what they're doing. Um, and again, there are people who are Generation X and baby boomers that very much believe in what we're saying here. Um, my advice would be find those examples to apply to where you work and say, hey, well, these guys pulled it off. Why can't we do it? Why don't we model it? What you'll also find is if you pick up the phone and call the other state and say, hey, what's the playbook, guys? They're going to email you the playbook. Um, which is a good thing. We should all be doing that. We should all share. That's why Project Upland is an open book. Uh, the only reason why it doesn't scare me that Project Upland is an open book is because every other major uh, Upland publication hates us and they think everything we say is toxic, so they're not going to try to replicate what I'm doing. So, <laughs> um, so I, I'd say that that's the best perspective to take it, is there are people in this culture who are in positions of power who are embracing these things. and. You might be difficult to get through. It might be frustrating. But the worst thing you can do is give up. So that's like one of those things. Push through it. People are aging out. Sorry. I'm not trying to. <laughs> Go ahead. I kind of have two questions. Sure. I'll shoot the first one. And then if no one else has questions, I'll ask the second. Thoughts on how to bring mentors to this new culture mm -hmm. of hunters? A um, couple things. So the tough part about mentorship is um, you can take somebody like me and put me with somebody who's very unlike me, and things can go south really quick, um, you know, depending on personalities or whatnot. And I actually got this piece of advice from somebody who's actually horrible at this stuff, and he is poison, in my opinion, to the culture. But um, he is very much of the mind that like people should mentor like people. And it makes sense. If, if you're 
a millennial mentoring with a millennial is going to be a far more successful scenario than you, you know, mentoring with a baby boomer. One of the things we're actually recently looking into is the concept of the fact that as millennials, we're very into self-learning. So like, um, one of my big gaps when I first started grouse hunting was like finding places to hunt. And there was no resource to do that. You just had a pound brush, get out there, find it, do it, which is cool. It's fun. I do love doing that. But um, start something Project Upland recently started doing, and now the Rough Grouse Society is about to do. Um, and I probably shouldn't say it while we're recording, but we call it, um, we call it Project Spot Burn. Um, and essentially what it is is to give information on specific public lands that you can actually go and hunt, where you can hunt it, how to identify the habitat once you get there. Um, so the idea is that mentorship might not ne be needed as much as we're leaning on it with millennials, because millennials are go-getters in a way. And if we could lower that bar, if we could make it easy that I could hop onto a website and say, all right, I live in the state of New Hampshire, and hop on roughgrousesociety.org and say, where can I find grouse in my state? And if I can find a nice, neat list that can show me where to go, and I know that a rough grouse biologist said that there are grouse there and they are huntable, um, that could potentially lower a lot of barriers. So um, I'm not 100% convinced that mentoring is the only method, but I would agree that as of all the data that stands today, it is the most, it's the best weapon we have. So. Now oh, go ahead. Do you have any like actual numbers? Has there been a study that says that millennials have identified themselves that they would rather be mentored by a millennial? We're gonna find Yeah. Supposing that. We're supposing that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're actually we have a study going out next week, um, and we're gonna be finding that question out. As well as the other thing that I was just theorizing is that it might be the case that millennials actually just want to do it on their own. They just don't have enough information to do it on their own. So we're diving into both of those to see if it's kind of a true thing. And again, one of the neutralities of Project Upland is that it's not people that are watching the Outdoor Channel, it's people that are from cities and from very unique backgrounds, not growing up hunting. So uh, we're gonna hopefully get a lot more accurate measurement on that. Um, can you go back to your slide where you're showing the percentage of people who are sure. support nonprofits? You know, I think it's right after this. Yes, 75%. Yeah. And that's specifically in the Project Upland crowd. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you. Yep. Well, how can you generalize to all millennials? So, uh, not to get too far down a rabbit hole, but 2019 Marketing 101 would tell you that Project Upland is a culture driven brand. So, it's not really Project Upland's brand, it's the community's brand. So, they're driving it, which tends to make fanatical members. Uh, people that are really passionate about it, people that are really die hard about it. So, there is a possibility, if I'm being unbiased, to say that that could you know, corrupt numbers. But if you do look at other statistics, um, which I think we had further back here, this stuff, the climate change, the lead is bad, the sustainability movement, all these kind of things that we do know are factually true. It kind of sets up this narrative where millennials are way more concerned about the environment by default. Yeah, but when I saw the 75% profit, I, my gut reaction was no. Like, yeah. It is, that just seems way too high. Yeah, it's... Uh, and the other thing to think too is this is a number that's reflective of upland millennial hunters um, which is a far different breed than a deer hunter or a bear hunter or the the only crowd that would probably be pretty similar would be a waterfall crowd so because um, you get that dog dynamic it just tends to be a very hardcore crowd so and then when you say nonprofits, is that specifically um Conservation organizations like that. there there was actually full disclaimer there and actually um, you can find this whole study online um, NAVDA was in that list so NAVDA is North American versatile hunting dog association for anybody who doesn't know that um, they're not technically doing any habitat work um, but what they do is um, essentially it's a club for learning how to train bird dogs um, not a competition thing so but that was part of that you sprinkled suggestions throughout your presentation about what I'm very suggestive. I'm a market. <laughs> but then you mentioned about the playbook. Yeah, yeah. Oregon. I'm curious what you might suggest the uh, top three or four items in the playbook might be to get the more engaged and Gen Zers and anyone oh. more engaged in hunting, fishing, right. outdoor experiences. Hold on. Where's the slide? Oh, we're just going to dive all the way back and forth here. 
this one. Authenticity is the word of 2019, um, or actually just millennial marketing. Um, the interesting thing about authenticity, and this is something that I stress to state agencies, uh, nonprofits, um, is that um, authenticity is actually a versatile word. If you create media that's authentic, baby boomers are not going to reject it. Um, so if you watch a Project Upland film and it's a young person out grouse hunting in Wisconsin and you're 75 years old and you've hunted grouse your whole life, you're probably still going to love it. Um, if you watch another film we made with like Earl the Pearl, who's a guide up in Minnesota, who's in his 60s, and you're a millennial, you're still going to like it. And if you're not a millennial, you're still going to like it. So authenticity, um, people take that as a literal thing. So honest stories, normal people. Um, it's a little further past that. There's an authenticity to artistic expression. I mean, I just, you know, it gets kind of down to this thing where it's like, if you're gonna film something, if you're gonna tell a story, if you're gonna take a photo, if you're gonna write stories, if you're gonna, I mean, if you look at the inside of this magazine, this is the type of stuff you see. This is not what Field and Streams looks like. Um, and ultimately what, we're, what I'm getting at is um, there's an authenticity to artistic expression that millennials demand. Um, whether you know it or not, like there's just, we've given birth to this whole culture that like believes in minimalist branding and how aesthetically good something looks. Um, and there's a lot of noise right now in the marketing world, digital marketing, all this kind of stuff. Uh, we're flooded with more information than any other, anybody, you know, it doesn't matter what age you are right now. We right now are being flooded with more marketing content. Um, and it's very hard to stand out. So to stand out, you need to be like, and this is something I always say to people is you're not competing against the outdoor channel. You're not competing against uh, meat eater. You're competing against the next Star Wars film. And if you can't get on that level, if you can't create cultures, if you can't fight that, if you can't create a lifestyle brand, you're just not going to win. You're not going to get through the noise. It's that simple. So, okay, I guess kind of related to that, I'm thinking about these larger organizations, like you said, like Boone and Crockett, or like, um, I'm thinking of like Safari Club International, yep. as in particular. Like that is an organization that from what I can tell is very trophy oriented. Yes. And, very, and it, I mean, African big game and stuff. And from what I can tell, just amongst my peers, that seems to be pretty unpopular. Yeah. So how is an organization like that, how do you see them evolving or kind of embracing millennials in a different way? Um, so they actually reached out to us to work with them on that. And first thing I actually said to him is I won't touch that with a 300 foot pole. <laughs> but, um, and part of that is because uh, that trophy hunting culture, um, previous, this culture that's dying right now never questioned the aspect of like African hunting. Um, and this gets down to that why thing. So it's like, I've been to Africa, I've hunted in Africa. Um, and what I found there was very complicated. And um, I was turned off by a lot of it. And like, I could, I like, I, Essentially, I just bird hunted the whole time I was there, and that's not really what I went there to do. So, because uh, bird hunting is just so less invasive in that space. So, um, the thing about millennials, millennials look at a subject like that, and they say, when people say, oh, well, you know, hunting is good for conservation, it's like, yeah, but you're talking about places that are far more complex. There's corruption, there's um, poaching, there's um, not accurate data tracking, there's just all these flaws in the system. So when you're in the United States and things are pretty black and white for us, luckily, and you do have people that are doing the responsible thing and trying to get sound numbers, management style, um, you don't have all those holes. So the problem with an organization like that is what they're gonna run into, it's just the fundamental rejection of the topic. Like I get that the concept of hunting elephant in Botswana makes sense because elephants are destroying their national park. Um, but hunting them in, um, let's say Mozambique doesn't make sense. Um, so the problem is it's just a politically charged thing. And on top of that, we're not there. And it's none of our business. I mean, it is like we don't want the planet to die. But there are people that are on the ground that and I know from firsthand stories that are pretty frustrated that Americans have a lot of strong opinions both ways um, because it is complex. So something like that, it's like, I don't know how you deal with it. I do know all those organizations are looking to deal with it. Uh, I'm sure closed door Boone and Crockett meetings, they're like, oh my God, this really got screwed up. Um, but a lot of those organizations do a lot of good and I don't want people to think that they don't do good. Um, and they're going to try to do the right thing. But technically what you could call this is, is what a lot of people call in the marketing industry, the third market rebellion. And part of the, the problem with a marketing rebellion, and this has nothing to do with hunting, this is culturally across the, the, the planet, is that 
brands that are blue chip funds and everything else are brought to their knees. And brands die in these rebellions. And there are some brands that will just never break the stigma. And we're going to see that. You're going to see gun companies, ammo companies, um, archery companies that are completely going to fail because they can't adapt. Um, and, and that's going to happen to some nonprofits as well. And there are some nonprofits that are in really, really, really bad shape right now. Um, I'm not going to get down this, but NRA is a perfect example. So um, any other questions? So I'm from the Chicago area. Yes. And I was never like, exposed to hunting um, until I transferred here. So I guess, like, do you have any ideas on how like, to kind of recruit millennials like, in like, heavy urban areas, like Chicago or like, you know, other places like that? I mean, so our strategy is Project Upland, we started as a film platform, so we just made a ton of films that are visually stunning, cinematic stories, um, and we just flooded the market. And we've had all sorts of people that have come from cities that happen to see it, and, and a lot of these people were already considering it, coming from uh, what we call fringe areas, like they might have been mountain bikers, they might have already been into wildlife photography, they might have been super passionate about organic gardening, um, all these things, and they just needed some really good projection of what hunting could be to get pushed over the edge. Um, so it's really just media companies flooding, you know, kind of the world to say, hey, listen, like, this isn't actually a bad thing. The long-term game, I mean, the reality is, is like everybody's panicking, oh my God, hunting's dying and we're all gonna suffer. Um, there's a lot of potentially good things that could come out of this. One, millennials are gonna make it much better and it's gonna survive much better and Generation Z will probably follow in those footsteps from the data that shows the differences in similarities or whatnot. Um, but on top of that, millennials will embrace one question that is like, this is definitely like, if, if you said this in a state agency meeting, and I did once, I literally almost got thrown out of the room, was the idea that hunters pay for the resource. And we have this kind of misidea that if like we kind of lose that voice, like we're going to lose everything. The reality is, is that hunters don't actually pay that much of the chunk of the Pittman Robinson. Most of that's actually coming from assault weapons, which is a crazy thing to say. So people that go to the range and blow out God knows how many per trillion rounds is actually pulling up most of the margin on this. Um, and then past that, it's fishing. So that's where these biggest tax chunks are. As a hunter and a millennial, my question is, is well, you have all these people that get mountain bikes, they get four wheelers, they get skis, they get snowshoes, they do wildlife photography, they do all these things. Why don't we have them be taxed on their items as well? And the reason that's an unpopular belief is that people think that hunters will be uninvited from the table. I don't feel that way. As a millennial, I don't feel threatened by that conversation. What I say is, we all have a moral obligation to this. We just happen to be a little more attuned to it. I do see that it's closing on 5 o'clock. Um, I think we should first uh, well, uh, say thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.